And I just look at myself and I said, wow, you know, and just to change myself and to perk up and, you know, because I've seen some difference. Uh, what's the whole scheme? What's the whole scope? It's scary. My brother, what I see is the crabs. And, you know, we often tell the story about the crabs in the basket. But before we talk about the crabs in the basket that pull each other down, I often ask us to look at the crabs while they're in the water before you put them in the basket. And what you'll notice about crabs in the water is that they do not pull each other down. They do not do the things to themselves once you take them out of their natural surroundings. They conduct themselves in nature's way. We are a people who have been taken out of our natural environment. In fact, I would dare say for us to act any other way than the way we're acting would be unnatural. To take a natural being out of his or her natural surroundings you automatically create a condition in which they will act unnaturally. We are a people who have been transplanted from what makes us who we are. We can see the same thing happening with peoples of Native American ancestry. We can see the same thing happen with people who have been taken from their natural surroundings. But to answer your question is I would direct you to the message that Dr. King gave us on April 3rd, 1968. Because I've been with people who have told me that story about Dr. King that last day of his life. Dr. King, his last day of his life, was very tired. He had, he had to go back to Memphis, which is interesting, isn't it? Memphis, Menes, Hikupatah, an Egyptian name. Interesting that he would go back to Memphis a second time. Memphis being Patah, where the hill rises up and consciousness sits atop this story of, of, of Memphis. The message that he gave us was that, well, the thing that people told me is that Martin Luther King was very tired. And he went to bed a little agitated, a little aggravated, a little high strung. And they said that when he woke up, there was a totally different person that woke up. He was calm, he was collect. There was something about his persona that was very different from the person that went to sleep. <clears throat> he gathered his things, and he went to the ballroom or wherever he went to give that speech. And he said a lot of things, but the thing that is most key to us is the last one minute and 17 seconds of his life. He said that he had gone, he said he didn't know what was going to happen. By the way, they also edit out that second thing he said after that. He said, could we got some sick white brothers out there? But they edit that out. Yeah. He said, I don't know what's going to happen with me now. we got some sick white brothers out there. But he said, I want you to know tonight that God has allowed, or the creative force had allowed him to go to the mountaintop. And that he had looked over and that he had seen the promised land. He said that he wasn't worried about anybody or anything, but that he wanted us to know that night that we as a people would get to the promised land. He warned us that we had difficult days ahead and that we'd be facing a lot of different trials and tribulations. But he said, I want you to know you're going to get there. That is my message. That's what I live by. I live by the fact that Harriet Tubman would never have done what she did if she thought we'd end up like this. I'm saying that I don't think that all of the people that have come before us, the prophets and the prophetesses, the males and females that put everything they had on the line, would have dropped what they did to do what they did if they thought we would end like this. I think that these are the best of times and these are the worst of times. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. I, being with children, have great faith in the future. I have good news, I have bad news. The good news is we're going to get to the promised land. Right on. But hold on, let me give you the bad news. The bad news is a lot of us aren't going to make it. As Erica Badu says, maybe the next lifetime. Maybe the next go round. But if you are going to spend your life chasing material things, you don't get it yet. And you know, African folk love good things now. We love good food, we love parties, we love gold. But not at the expense of other humans' misery. And when other people are suffering as they are, we have no right to live the way we live. We have no right to have five cars 
when someone doesn't even have their next meal. We don't have a right for that. And it's Martin Luther King who told us that the hottest, see, I don't believe hot is, I, don't, I personally don't believe hell is hot. To me, hell is cold. If you don't believe me, just wait another two months and you see what I'm talking about. But in his, in his metaphor of hell being hot, he said that the hottest part of hell is reserved for those who stand by and watch and do nothing. Not even the ones that are doing the wrong are going to go to the hot part. It's those that stand by and watch. It's those that don't come out and stand up and say what needs to be said. I'm a human being. I once told some children a story about when I was down in uh, Broward County that the Klan had threatened to bomb a place that I was going to speak at. And afterwards, uh, some of them approached me with guns. And the children asked me, they said, well, how did you feel? And, and you know, they, I know they thought I was going to say it one way, but I told them I was absolutely scared. I was frightened. I said, if, if, if I hadn't positioned my legs so far apart, they would have heard my knees knocking. <laughs> now, the, now, I could have said it another, I could have acted all big and bad and brave for the children, but I wasn't. And I'm a human being. I am afraid of things. I'm afraid of anything that anyone else is afraid of. In fact, if anybody ever tells you that they're fearless, don't you ever follow them. Because they'll have you go off the precipice with them. I'm a human being and I have fears. And each and every one of us has a right to have fears. You have a right to have fear, but you have no right not to have courage. No right not to have courage. No right not to tell our children the truth about what they're seeing and what they're feeling, in spite of what you may think the result will be. Sometimes my children look at me with some of the programs that they're watching on TV. I tell them, you're not watching that on my TV. You're not even going to watch that on your TV. You're not going to watch it. Now, there are some parents who might be concerned and want to be in with the children and don't want the children to dislike them. And I love I, I don't care what you feel about me. My job is to make sure that your mind is clear and clean. Now, I know that your friends are going to talk about it. It's going to be the major topic of discussion. Dawson Creek, you're going to talk about tomorrow at lunch. But you're not going to be able to say your father sat in the same room with you and let you do that. Every time they talk, I want to implant in your mind what I believe to be morally right and wrong. And just because Europeans have lost their sensibilities of what is decent and just, it doesn't mean that I have to let my children go down that road too. You don't have to do that. And, you know, Europeans have a funny thing, you know, they have a penchant to look at black men dressed like women. They had a thing about Martin and Shanene. They, I mean, they, they have a thing, and you know something? We do it good. We do it good, too, you know. Nothing wrong with that. That's acting. We're good actors. We're good actresses. My problem with the actors and actresses is not that they're playing their parts. My problem is they're playing them so well. We play slaves real good. We play maids and butlers real good. We know exactly how to drive Miss Daisy. I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem when I sit with Nubians in Africa and they tell me the only exposure they have to African Americans is when they read Uncle Tom's Cabin. I have a problem when the only exposure they have to some of us as a people all around the world is to look at Martin. I wouldn't have a problem with Martin if they showed people like Paul Robeson and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. I have no problem with showing us as we are. That's who we are. We're funny. We can play all parts. We can play women, play men, men play women. We can curse, we can laugh, we can joke. My problem with the color purple was not the, the content of that material. I know there are fathers that abuse their daughters. I have no problem with that. But you've got to show me a couple of good black men somewhere. Okay, you're going to show the negative side. Show the positive side too. Balance it off. So, Bruce, the place, my problem is not that that doesn't happen. I know that happens. I've seen it. I've had children come talk to me. But I've also had children come tell me some good things about their fathers and good things about their mothers. And the struggling people in our communities, not the ones that we know about, but the ones that are those, those strongholds in our communities, those pillars, those columns that are part of the community center, that are standing outside the community center and telling Kwame, come on in here. You know you're supposed to be in here. What would your mother think if she didn't see you? Come on in here. you got a wood shop class going on, or there's a class going on in here, or there's a camp we're going to this weekend. Are you interested? We have people who we will never know. This is why when I do my, um, 
my, my libations. One a very important part of my libation is not only to call those Africans that we know, but to call 